great. So, and um, thanks to these three guys uh, for checking my slides for typos. Uh, they, I noticed they didn't find the one in their own name, so uh, that's a bad sign. We'll see how we go. Okay. <coughs> So I'm going to start with the talk. I, I'm not going to talk about waffle witten theory for the first lecture and a half, just about background material. Um, I try to go as simply as possible, but of course it's not possible to describe everything in this field in intimate detail. So um, there's going to be there's going to be stuff where I just maybe uh, give a guide to how one would go about understanding something. Uh, and so I'm going to set a bunch of exercises, but maybe more suitable exercises are just flesh out the, the slides. So there'll be slides that particularly interest you that you feel I didn't give enough detail. A perfectly good exercise is to flesh that out or to start fleshing that out, maybe go and look at some of the references um, and to talk to the, uh, the tutors about it or to talk to me about it. So these are some references. There's many more um, in some kind of order that we use them. Uh, exercises will be in green, but as I say, much better exercises is just to flesh out all the bits that I skate over. So let's begin. Um, so this course is going to be about coherent sheaves. So I'm always going to be on a smooth projective variety over the complex numbers. N is its dimension. Um, there'll be a, an ample line bundle, which I'll call O1 and its first chain class is H. So that's just notation. A coherent sh a sheaf, what I'll mean by a sheaf will always be a coherent sheaf. So that means it's just locally finitely generated by the structure sheaf. So over an open set U, it has a presentation like this. And then uh, this is less an exercise than more sort of revision or go back and remember why that means that not just that it's finitely generated, but that it's finitely presented. So the kernel of that map, the kernel of that map is also finitely generated. And then why, after finitely many steps, the kernel becomes locally free. So you get a resolution like this. Okay, so the exercise is to uh, go and make sure you're happy with this. Um, it uses the fact that X is smooth. And if you want a reference um, Griffiths and Harris, of course, it's analytic rather than algebraic, but the proofs are the same. Griffiths and Harris have a, I, I really like their way of dealing with this. It, it's very quick. Okay, so you should think of a coherent sheaf as some kind of vector bundle with singularities, where the singularities uh, are um, the locus where this, this rank drops. Um, so this, ma this map here from one vector bundle to another, this matrix, uh, where its rank drops, F sort of picks up singularities. And away from that, it's a vector bundle. Um, its support is a, a subscheme of X defined by this ideal sheaf over an open set U. It's just those functions which annihilate all the sections of F um, define an ideal sheaf and therefore a sub subscheme uh, called the support of F. And F is really pushed forward from that support. It's a, it's a sheaf on the support whose push forward is the original F. And then we talk about the dimension of a sheaf is the dimension of its support. So I'll give some examples. Any questions? So O sub F is the quotient of uh, uh, regular functions by uh, this idea? No. Um, no, that, so F is a module over the quotient. So uh, what you just said is the structure sheaf of the support, and F is a module over the structure sheaf of the support. So F is a sheaf on the support, but it needn't be the structure sheaf. So you could imagine F being a rank two vector bundle on a, subs on a point or on a subscheme. Uh, and then the support would be that subscheme. This ideal sheaf would be the ideal sheaf of that subscheme, but F itself would have, F would be the push forward of something of rank two on that subscheme. So it wouldn't be a quotient of the structure sheaf. It would be a quotient. In this case, it would locally be two copies of the structure sheaf of that subscheme. So the organizers, if, if there's questions online. I think, yeah. Okay, great. I yeah. 
it's fantastic that people are able to attend this online, but I can't believe they're really paying attention. They're just looking at the internet, right? So I mean, yeah, but they're, they're reading the news or looking at the sport. Or they're like checking out England's chances of winning the Euros. <laughs> they're not really paying attention. So okay. And now sheaves are called pure. So if it has dimension D, it's called pure if it has no dimension strictly less. Well, Subsheaves. There is a question. Sure. In the, okay, you have to go back. Yeah. So it says if R is equal to N in the first exercise. No. Okay. Definitely not. I mean, F could actually be this guy, right? It could be R copies of the structure sheaf, where R is the rank of F. It could be. R, R is not the rank of F in general, but um, F could well be just this sheaf, and R could be as big as you like. Okay, so um, <coughs> there's this notion of pure for sheaves. I'll give an example in a minute. And it implies uh, that both the support and the structure sheaf of the support are also pure. Uh, and exercises to show that when, when the support is an integral subscheme, um, then pure means that the, the sheaf is torsion free on its support. So it's the push forward from its support of a torsion free sheaf. So a sheaf where, with no torsion, where the, there's no element of the structure sheaf that annihilates a section of the sheaf. So some examples. If D is a Cartier divisor, well, X is smooth, so if D is a divisor, uh, then the structure sheaf is pure. And that's true even if the divisor doesn't have to be reduced. And you could take many copies of this example to answer some of the questions. Um, so that then it won't be rank one on its support, it can have higher rank on its support. So for instance, these are pure modules over uh, the polynomials in two variables. But this is not pure. Okay, so if I take um, the structure sheet for this subscheme that I've drawn in red, so where I've set x, y to zero, so I get the two axes, and then I set y squared to zero, so I, I don't get the full y axis, I only get its first order piece at the origin. <coughs> That's not pure because of this embedded point at the origin, which gives you this zero-dimensional submodule. So this is a one-dimensional sheaf, but it has this zero-dimensional submodule, which is just the structure sheaf of the origin, mapping into our sheaf or module uh, by y. Okay, and because um, y times anything is zero, x times y is zero, and y squared is zero, this really does uh, define a, a well-defined module map uh, from the structure sheaf, so the, this, is, this is sort of CXY divided by the maximal ideal XY. Okay, any, any questions about that? Okay, now I should tell you about stability. So um, we have the Hilbert polynomial of a sheaf, which is we twist it up many times, here by T, by that, that uh, polarization, O1, T times. And then we take the space of sections, so or the holomorphic Euler characteristic. For large T, the two are the same. And that's some polynomial in T. And the leading coefficient is given by T to the D. Sorry, the leading term is T to the D, where D is the dimension of the support. So usually when we think of something like a torsion-free sheaf of the whole variety, that the leading term is t to the n, and then the leading coefficient is roughly the volume of the manifold, so like that h to the n divided by n factorial, times the rank of the sheaf. So you should think of up to some irrelevant constants. This leading term is the rank of the sheaf um, if, if d is n, so if f is uh, torsion-free, so let's say, or support f is if f has rank bigger than zero. And then the reduced Hilbert polynomial is where we make that monic, 
so we get rid of the leading term. And then the slope, there's different notions of slope, but what I'm going to take is the leading term in the case where d is n. So uh, to start with, let's assume f has rank bigger than zero, so its dimension is n, so it's supported over the whole variety. Then this, this sort of second term here, or the, I mean this first term is the same for all sheaves, so the, the first interesting term here is called the slope. And more generally, if, if d is less than n, we just set that slope to be plus infinity because uh, a n will be zero. So if a n is zero, we just set this to be plus infinity. Okay. And then there's different notions of stability. There's slope stability, Giesecke's stability, and others, uh, which, which use this polynomial. So slope stability only uses its leading term, its first interesting term. Giesecke's stability uses the whole polynomial. And there's other things as well. But let's start with slope stability. So we have this, this notion of slope. So it's just the, um, by Riemann rock, you can work out what it is. Um, and it's the degree of the sheaf. So it's the first churn class, the degree of the first churn class of the sheaf, divided by the rank of the sheaf. Okay, so up to some constants. The, the leading term here is the rank of the sheaf. And then the subleading term is the degree of the sheaf. And then f is slope stable or semi-stable if and only if whenever you have a subsheaf and a quotient like this which is non-trivial so neither a nor b should be zero then you want that the the slope of a should be the less than the slope of b. So the brackets are what you might guess. So if I want stability then I should have a strict inequality here. And if I want semi-stability, I allow the non-strict inequality. Sorry, can you repeat for the discipline component? Uh, where these these come from? So, it, um, so d here was the dimension of the sheaf. So if if the sheaf is supported over the whole variety, then d is n. So this will be a n and this will be a n minus 1. This will roughly be the rank of the sheaf and this will roughly be the degree of the sheaf, the first churn class dotted with the hyperplane class. Um, and then the slope is the quotient of those. So if the, if the dimension of the sheaf is less than n, then a n will be 0. The first term will be in lower degree, so this d will be less than n. And so a n will be 0, so then we just set the slope to be plus infinity. I, did I answer your question? I mean, these are all given by Riemann Rock formula. They're all just, these are all topological numbers. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're the Euler characteristic of this, um, the sheaf twisted up many, many times. We only consider this for large T. Uh, for example, when the sheaf is pure, couldn't you use AD minus 1 over AD as the... You can. That's a different notion of slope, and that's relevant, but we're, we're not going to deal with it now. Yeah. yeah, that's absolutely right. Okay, so we have this definition of stability, which at the moment looks arbitrary, but I will try and motivate it a little bit. I'll show you it has good properties. And I'll, I'll say something about how you should think about where it comes from and why, why it's there. But for now, just accept it for one more slide. Just accept it. This is the definition. That subsheaves should have lower slope and quotient sheaves should have higher slope. Okay, that's, that's the definition of stability. <coughs> In particular, if your slope's semi-stable, you must be torsion-free. So maybe, maybe that should be an exercise. But th that's because... If you had um, a subsheaf of lower dimension, so if you had any torsion in your sheaf, that would give you a subsheaf of lower dimension, but that would immediately have slope infinity because that would have an is zero. So you'd have slope plus infinity here, and your f would have finite slope, and so and your b would have finite slope. So you would you would destabilize. Yeah, maybe that's an exercise. That that grey comment should be an exercise. Because you have to pick the right torsion, you need to pick the maximal torsion subsheaf in order to violate this. It could be torsion, right? 
uh, in particular, slope. F could be torsion. I think I don't want to define slope stability using, if F is torsion, I don't want to define, yeah. Yeah, maybe I should have been more careful. I would want to use your notion of slope at that point. Let's take F here to be, um, let's take F to have full dimension at the moment. Where's KO? Yeah. <coughs> yeah, I was trying to simplify things to make things to do one example, which is simpler, um, but now everyone's finding the flaw in that. Uh, we'll go on to Giesecke stability in a minute and everything will be hunky-dory. Okay, so exercise the seesaw inequality that the slope of A and the slope of B, the relationship between the two is more or less the same as the relationship between the slope of A and the slope of F. So roughly speaking, this condition, that the slope of A should be less than the slope of F, is, is, is very similar to the slope of A being, sorry, this condition, the slope of A should be less than the slope of B, is very close to the condition that the slope of A should be less than the slope of F. So this is just some rearrangement of this inequality using these numbers. It's a good exercise to do if you've never done it. It's called the seesaw inequality. Um, but it's not quite the same. So you, don't, you should not define stability as being that the slope of A is less than the slope of F. Um, because they're not quite the same. They're the same when the dimension of B is the same as the dimension of F. So here. And, but here's an exercise, which, here, here's an example which will show you why they're not exactly the same. So here, this is an, the ideal sheaf of a, let's say, a closed point in X. You should have a think about this example. And uh, this does not destabilize according to my definition, but it does semi-destabilize if you took the definition here. So uh, go, I'll let you go away and think about it. We don't want to get into a big discussion about it. Okay, so Giesecke stability. So this is um, going to be a bit more robust, I think. Um, what we say is very similarly, instead of using slope, which was really just the, the leading coefficient of this, the, the first interesting coefficient of this reduced Hil Hilbert polynomial, we're now going to use the whole Hilbert polynomial for large t. So you can see this is an extremely similar notion. So your Giesecke semi-stable, if and only if, the Hilbert polynomial of the subsheaf is less than the Hilbert polynomial of the quotient sheaf, where less or less equal are um, described in the following way. So you should concentrate on the first line. So we say that a polynomial is less than another polynomial, a monic polynomial is less than another monic polynomial. If and only if, well, it, when they have the same degree, you should, it's just the obvious lexicographic ordering that P of T should be less than Q of T for large T. Okay, so you can imagine that's very closely related to the, the first non-trivial coefficients satisfying the same inequality. But we have to be careful and stick in this second condition that when, um, when Q has lower degree, then we should say it's bigger than P. So that's confusing because um, the inequality seems to go the wrong way around. But it's because somewhere we divided by zero. It was to do with all the questions on the previous slide. It's because, you know, some an minus one is zero. So when we divide by zero, we should get plus infinity. And so that, that, that's the origin of this. But basically what it means is um, that <coughs> you're destabilized either by things of higher. So if, you're, if you have a subsheaf with a bigger reduced polynomial than the quotient, quotient sheaf, that destabilizes you. Or if you have a subsheaf of lower dimension than F, then that destabilizes you. So in other words, if F is not pure, then you're unstable. So, an, so you can either take this as a definition or you can take the definition that you only insist on the first condition but you also ask that F must be pure and the two are equivalent. Okay. So what you find is that Giesecke semi-stable sheaves are pure. These are all uh, cross-free sheaves. 
Sorry? So these are not torsion free sheaves. Not now, no, these are arbitrary sheaves now. Yeah. I, I think they were probably, yeah. Gizek is for torsion free. No, 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 you can have Gizek stability for any sheaves. Yeah. Okay, and again, it's equivalent to the reduced Hilbert polynomial of the subsheaf being less than the reduced Hilbert polynomial of the actual sheaf whenever the dimension of the quotient sheaf is, is full, is the same as the dimension of f. But again, it's not equivalent when that condition doesn't hold. So you have to be careful. Okay, so I want to say something about these. Oh, maybe another exercise would be to show that... Um, I just write it here. I appreciate it's a bit small for the people um, look, checking the BBC News. Um, but uh, you could, a good exercise would be yeah, to check you're happy with these definitions that um, slope semi stable. Let's take the case where um, maybe dim f is, is the full dimension of x, then slope semi stable. implies Giesecke semi-stable, implies Giesecke stable, implies uh, slope stable. Did I get it all wrong? Bugger. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. In France, you, in France, you use the implications the other way, don't you? Sorry, this was the English way of writing. It's amazing how you can't think at the board. Okay, thank you. Please <laughs> continue to do that. Okay, so uh, let me, I'll leave that up just for a second. Uh, let, me, um, <coughs> let me try and motivate these notions of stability, which are a bit weird, and show you some nice properties. Um, firstly, I'll just tell you a fact that they arise naturally when you try and form the moduli space by a geometric invariant theory. So you can try and form all these moduli spaces as quotients of quot schemes. So you try and see your sheaves as quotients of some fixed big sheaf like many copies of the structure sheaf twisted by minus n for large n, something like that. So you try and see all your sheaves as quotients of a fixed sheaf, so you manage to see them all in a quot scheme, and then you have to divide by all the possible choices that got you, it, that described it as a quotient, in particular the automorphisms of the fixed sheaf. And so you end up doing geometric invariant theory, and that gives you a notion of semi-stability, and you, you end up with this one. Uh, another way of thinking about it is that um, what it's saying is that quotient sheaves within reason should have more sections than subsheaves. All right? So that, it, that's not quite true. That, to leading order, the amount of sections you have when you're twisted up by large T is given by the rank. So you can't get away from that. So that, this, this is not compatible with that, right? So the rank is what determines the number of sections to leading order. But to subleading order, to the next order, modulo the rank, what determines how many sections you have is, a, is this either the reduced Hilbert polynomial or the, or the slope. And what this is saying is that quotient sheaves should have roughly the right amount of sections according to their rank, but then to next order, the amount of sections they have, they should have, well, they should have more than the subsheaves. And that makes sense, right? If you have sections of F, they give you, just by law, they give you sections of B. So B has lots of sections. Whereas getting sections, of course, many of them are zero because they lay in A, but generally speaking, it's easier to get a section of B by just taking a section of F and projecting it. What's harder is to get a section of A because your section of F has to satisfy lots of conditions to actually lie in A. So you should think of F, B as having more sections than A. Okay? That, and that's roughly speaking what stability says. And this is the generic situation. So stability is a generic condition. In fact, it's a Zariski open condition. 
and the generic sheaf is stable. So if there's a single stable sheaf, then there's as risky open, you know, in the space of all sheaves in some sense. Um, those which are stable, it's a risky open, so they're dense. So that, that's, that's why it's an important notion. But now I want to show you why it's, um, that it has nice properties to motivate it, I think, to explain it a bit better. But first, are there any questions? Okay, so, um, so I give you two nice properties of stability. So one is this thing that's a bit like the Schurlemma in representation theory, um, that if you have two stable sheaves of the same Chern classes or same Hilbert polynomial, uh, then they satisfy this property that there's no Homs between them, unless, of course, they're the same. And, and when they're the same, the only automorphisms they have is multiples of the identity. OK, so um, I do this for slope stability, but you could also do it for Giesecke stability. The argument's very similar uh, and very simple. It's that if you do have a morphism from f to g, you just factor it in this way. Um, you just write the map has a kernel and an image, and then the image, so the image is a quotient of f, and then it's a sub of, she, of g. And that gives you this chain of inequalities that the slope of f should be less than the slope of the image because always, as you go to the right, slope should increase. Uh, but the slope of the image should be the less than the slope of g, because it's a sub. Uh, but of course, g and f have the same topological type, so um, their slope's the same. So you get this contradiction here. Unless one of the exact sequences is trivial, which means that phi is either, either the kernel's zero or the image is zero. So either you have the zero map, so we're in this case, or you get that phi is an isomorphism, so now you can think of f and g as being the same. And in that case, when f and g are the same, then exercise, run this argument again for uh, phi minus multiples of the identity and pick, find a, an appropriate, essentially, eigenvalue of phi to show that eventually this can't be an isomorphism. For some lambda, this can't be an isomorphism, so it must be zero. So phi is a multiple of the identity. Right, so that's one nice property of stability. So you're choosing C to be a base field for uh, all this? Forever, yeah, yeah. And then this is the really nice property of stability. So this is really why it works and why we have this definition. Uh, it's separatedness, essentially, of the moduli space of stable sheaves. So it's the one parameter criterion for separatedness. So it's the, the, the moduli of sheaves, of stable sheaves, is Hausdorff. So here's the setup. Pick two families of sheaves parameterized by a curve. So let's just say the affine line. Okay. So we pick these two families of sheaves. Uh, they, they should vary nicely. The right condition is flatness over the base. And think of them as one parameter families of sheaves, ET and FT. And suppose they're all stable. Then what you find is, if they're isomorphic away from the central fibre, then they're isomorphic over the central fibre, and moreover, the, the families are identical. The families are the same. Okay? So hopefully it's clear to you this is, this is saying that they, the moduli space has a nice separatedness property, or Hausdorff property. And then the sketch of the proof is that um, when you take the HOMs down the fibres, you get a line bundle away from the origin just by the previous slide and base change. So on, on the fibres, the on, on the non-zero fibres, um, because E and T, because the, the sheaves E, T and F, T are isomorphic, they have precisely multiples of the identity as their, their homomorphisms from one to the other. So you find that um, <coughs> the homs on the fibres are one-dimensional. So what, what that means is that the, the relative homs, the sheaf of relative homs, is a line bundle away from the origin. And it's torsion-free. And that's because of the way you define this. You have to remember how this is defined, this sheaf. It's not defined fibre-wise. It's defined over open sets in the base. 
And so um, <coughs> if, if the Homs jump on the central fibre, you might think that this sheaf would be a line bundle with maybe a little bit of torsion over the central fibre. But that's not the case because you don't see, if you only have extra Homs on the central fibre, you don't see that in this sheaf because this sheaf is defined by taking an open set of the origin downstairs and looking at the homs above that upstairs. And there won't be any because there's just some homs on the central fibre, but they don't extend to homs on the open set. OK, so it's an exercise to understand this statement here. I've been a bit slack about it. Um, but uh, it's a good thing to go away and check you're happy with. What happens is if the homs on the central fibre jump, you won't see that in this sheaf, you'll see it in the next one. Um, so the, the X1, the relative X1 sheaf will get some torsion. It'll get, um, you know, the structure sheaf of the origin or something in it. But in this sheaf, you won't see it. OK, so it's actually a line bundle on C, and therefore it's the trivial line bundle on the affine line. And so you can pick a nowhere vanishing section. And the fact that it's nowhere vanishing means that on the central fibre, it's a non-zero homomorphism uh, from E0 to F0. And therefore, again by the previous slide, it must be an isomorphism. So what you end up with is this section is an isomorphism on every fibre, and so it's an isomorphism. Um, so again, obviously I'm, I'm sketching this and I'm not writing in all the details, so if, if it interests you, uh, hopefully this is enough to give you an idea of why it's true, and if it interests you, then go in and flesh this out and make it a theorem. But uh, I think more important is to give an example where this fails if you don't have the stability condition. So go away and check you're happy that moduli of sheaves are just not, is not a well-behaved thing if you don't have stability. You, you get um, hopelessly non-separated moduli. OK, and there's also another property, which is when you take semi-stable sheaves and then you have to divide by something called S equivalence, which I'm not going to go into, um, then uh, the moduli spaces are proper. And uh, so that's a wonderful property and it's very important in many things, but it's not so important in my lectures because in waffer witten theory, the moduli spaces which arise are not proper anyway. So I'm not going to go into this, but this is something very important that I don't have time to um, go through. OK, so I want to do a little bit of deformation theory. Again, I'm just going to give you the rough idea. So let's start with vector bundles. How, how do I get rid of this uh, thing at the top? Right, OK. <coughs> so let's start with locally free sheaves, so vector bundles. So these are made from gluing trivial vector bundles on affine open cover and you glue them over overlaps by transition functions which satisfy the co-cycle condition. Ooh. Well, you need to know that th th there is a moduli scheme, so that comes from geometric invariant theory. And then um, the one, there's this, uh, what's it called, the one-parameter criterion for separating this is this, basically that uh, if, you, if you look in Hartshorn for the one parameter criterion for separatedness, then check that basically it's what I wrote down. Yeah. So, so it basically says that, um, brilliant, thank you. When you have a family of vector bundles, um, you want to know, so separatedness says that uh, when you have a family, you can fill in the central fiber uniquely. And the one parameter criterion says you can, you can test this just with smooth curves. And that was what I did. Yeah. OK. So now we can deform, if we have a vector bundle, we can deform it by infinitesimally altering these overlaps. So I'm going to change my overlap, uh, my transition function, sorry, on the overlap. I'm going to deform it by this. I'm going to change it by this little guy here. And then I'm, I'm going to work to first order. So I'm going to assume that t squared is 0. So when you write down, when you do this, when you change the um, transition functions over overlaps, 
Uh, then you have to check that the co-cycle condition still holds. When you do that mod t squared, so let's set t squared to zero, uh, then what, what you find is that these eijs here uh, form a, a check co-cycle. So they're, whatever it's called, check co-closed. And then moreover, so, so they, they define an element in h1 of nd. And moreover, when you only consider them up to isomorphisms, so when you consider two to be the same, if there's an isomorphism of a bundle which takes one to the other or something, then, then you find you divide out by check co-boundaries. So you end up with it that this check group here is the first order deformations of your bundle. And then uh, you can go further. I mean, I, I've got to admit, I haven't done this exercise recently, but I promise I did it when I was your age. So. Uh, it, these things are hard, but they're worth doing. They're, I mean, they're, they're easy when you see them, but they, they take forever to think up. Anyway, um, so when you do the co-cycle condition to the next order, then what you should find is you get this first order deformation here cupped with itself in H2 of ND. And, you know, for that, you've got to remember what the cup product is in Czech cohomology, and nobody knows that. So, you know, there's a, th these are easy exercises for me to state, and they're kind of lengthy for you to do and you shouldn't worry about taking hours or days over them or discussing them with your colleagues. Okay, and this is the obstruction to extending the deformation to second order. Okay, and I, I'm going to do all this in more detail for sheaves by a different method in a second. All right, but there's a general principle that you, what you find in these deformation problems is that you usually find a bunch of cohomology groups where let's say the zeroth cohomology groups are the infinitesimal automorphisms that's clearly the case here and people tend to call those T0 the deformations are the next cohomology group that's what we saw here these are, tend to be called T1 and then the obstructions are the next cohomology group so let's do this for sheaves and here I really did the exercise so I'm honest and you'll see it's non-trivial to make it all fit together. Okay, so I'm going to do deformations of sheaves here. I'm going to work. I, I see people are taking notes. These are, I can give you these slides afterwards. And uh, I think they're going to be posted online without the pauses. So um, you will have something to look at. Okay, so I'm going to work over spec of the dual numbers. So I'm setting t squared to zero. And then later when I do obstructions, I'm going to go to next order by working over this A2 space. And A0 is just the origin, it's just C, spec of C. Okay, a first order deformation of a sheaf is a sheaf over x times A1, spec of the dual numbers. So it's x plus a little vector normal to x, right? It's x times by a, a little fat point. I want things to be flat over A1. I'm not going to go over flatness just for lack of time. Um, and it, this sheaf <coughs> over this thickened space should restrict to my original sheaf over x times the origin. So that's what a first order deformation is. And I want to show how to describe them. Okay, so let's, let's suppose we have a first order deformation and we'll go in the opposite direction in a minute. Okay, so take a first order deformation, restrict it to x, then you get your original sheaf is zero. Okay, and so what you end up with is this exact sequence because the kernel of a restricting to x is multiplication by t. Okay, and since t squared is zero, what you find is uh, the first map factors through e1 modulo t. It, it kills anything in e1 that's been multiplied by t because t squared is zero. Therefore, it factors through here, and this, of course, is e0. All right. And then the exercise is to check that the result is a, an exact sequence so that you can make this exact on the left if you replace that E1 by E0. So flatness makes this an exact sequence. All right. So you should think of this as the x direction at this stage is not so important. What's going on here, what this really looks like is up to the x, you know, modulo all the stuff going on in the x direction, what this looks like in the a1 direction is just
this is the, you know, this, this is the functions on A1. I restrict them to the origin. And what's the kernel? It's just a copy of C. Um, but it's, it's, those, it's the functions multiplied by x. Oh, sorry, t. Okay. So that's what's going on here. Those are your two e zeros, and this is the e1. Okay. Up to what's going on in the extraction. Okay, and now if we just take sections in the A1 direction, so push down to x, then this becomes this gives us an exact sequence on x. Originally this was an exact sequence on x times A1, but we can think of it by because the A1 direction is affine, uh, we can just take sections in that direction and we get uh, an exact sequence on x. Okay, so we get an extension, so that's classified by um, an, this extension group. All right, so we get an element of this extension group. And the claim is that this completely classifies the first order deformation. So I, I need to go backwards. Given one of these, I claim I can produce a first order deformation, E1. So um, conversely, given a first order deformation, I get an extension on X. And I'm going to call these two maps iota and pi. And that's fine, but that's a sheaf on x. And what I'm meant to produce is a sheaf on x times a1. So I need to make it not in, it's already an ox module. I need it to be an ox brackets t over t squared module. I need to tell you what the action of t is on this e1. All right. But we know what the action of t should be on e1 from this exact sequence. Okay. It should kill everything coming from the left because t squared is zero so it should kill e zero because this this multiplication by iota we're expecting to be multiplication by t so it should kill this guy in other words it should factor through here so you should project to here and then because of the action of t it should be multiplication by t so you should take this guy stick it there and multiply by t and end up in there all right, so I probably confuse you completely, but anyway, my claim is that you can make this into an OXT over T squared module by making T act as this map. And then the exercise is to show that's correct, to show that the result is flat over A1. So th there's two parts to this exercise. First, you should show that I have described an OXT over T squared module. In other words, that this uh, map here has square zero and commutes with all the x, you know, it commutes with ox, that, that bit's sort of obvious, it's an ox module map, but you should show that t squared, this, this map here has square zero, so it really defines the structure of an oxt over t squared module. And then, once you've done that, once you have this module, you should show it's flat over a1. Okay. And that's, when you get everything in the right order, it's completely trivial, it's one line, but getting everything in the right order is, um, is hard the first time you do it, and you learn a lot. Okay. So what you find is that first order deformations are given by this x1, so that's the tangent space of the moduli space. And uh, another exercise is to relate that to the previous, where the description I gave you for locally free shoes. So, um, for, for vector bundles, um, when you have a vector bundle, this exact sequence on X splits locally. All right, so exact sequences of vector bundles are always locally split. Uh, and so you should glue the splittings by um, transition functions over overlaps. Um, where the two splittings are not compatible over overlaps, so you change them by, instead of taking a direct sum here, you change them by some map from here to here. So you change them by this upper diagonal guy here. Okay, and you should see this recovers the previous description.
Okay, so now to second order, what I want to see is an obstruction. If I have a first order deformation, there should be an there might be an obstruction to extending it to second order, and I want and that should lie in x two now, the next cohomology group up, and I want to see that. So I, I really did the exercise. Pyrrhic's seen this once before. Do you remember this five years ago? Um, <coughs> so let's suppose we had managed to find a second order extension. So we managed to find a deformation not just of my E0, but really of my E1, my, my sheaf over X times A1. I managed to find an extension flat over A2 to here. Okay, call it E2. Then we get an exact sequence here. So I can take my sheaf over A2, I can restrict it to A1. The kernel are the things which are, d are already multiplied by T squared because t squared is 0 in A1. Uh, so what you find is that the kernel is by flatness is t squared times E0. But instead of restricting to A1, so this, you know, I think you can see this is um, what I've written down there, modulo what's going on in the x direction. What I've written down in the A2 direction is just here's the A2 guy. Uh, I can map it to the A1 guy. And the kernel is just a single copy of C. But instead, Instead of restricting to A1, I could restrict to A0. I could restrict to the origin. So I could just map to the origin here. And then the kernel will be T lots of, you know, C of T modulo T squared. So this will be um, essentially the functions on A2, but I multiply them by T under this map. Okay, so let's put that on the diagram. So they're the two different ways I can look at this sheaf. It's on A2. I can either restrict it to A1 or to A0. So to A1, that's the horizontal one, and to A0 is the vertical one. OK, and when I do that, <coughs> they fit together in the following way. OK, so um, when I restricted vertically to A0, I had this very big kernel, and the, the, the smaller kernel sits inside it. Okay, so the, the t's, you know, in this diagram here, uh, the, thi the, the functions which are already multiplied by t certainly contain the functions which are already multiplied by t squared. So they fit into this exact sequence, um, and similarly down here. So once I restrict it to A1 over here, horizontally, on A1 I could further restrict to A0. So it's obvious this restriction map to, A0, to, to the origin factors through restricting first to A1 and then restricting to the origin. Okay, so that's all this diagram says. So I end up with this. All right? So you recognize this vertical guy is the original description of the extension E1 in terms of an X class for on the E0s. This is the new one I've got. This is T time. This is also the original extension um, of E0 by E0 to give E1, all multiplied by T. Okay, so everything's familiar in this diagram, but you know, you need some time to absorb it and you won't do it right now. And then you can look at what this says in terms of extension groups. Okay, so um, <coughs> my E2 is defining me an extension group on X given by extensions from E1 to E0. So that's this guy. All right. When I uh, go up to this row, that's giving me the, stand the extension I started with, which defined E1. So the original extension which defined E1 was an extension from E0 to E0, and that's this guy here. Okay, so my E2 
is restricting to my E1 when I um, look at what the extensions do on the kernel of the map to the origin. All right, and this sits inside an exact sequence. So this is just the long exact sequence of extensions to E0. So um, I take, look at this vertical column here. I take extensions of this sequence, of, this, of these sheaves to E0. That gives me a long exact sequence of X groups. Okay. And then the next X group along is X2 from this guy E0 to E0. Okay, and this is the co-boundary map. And what you see is that um, when I have an extension E2, that gives me this extension class which maps to E1 and therefore E1 must map to 0 here. All right? So when I, when I have a second order extension of my sheaf, then the first order extension class must map to 0 in this X2 group uh, because it comes from here. Right. And so what you find is that this E2 exists, so I can find an extension here, which maps to my extension E1 that I started with, if and only if E1 maps to 0 in X2 here. Okay. So we call this the obstruction class. So <coughs> the logic is probably a bit confusing here because I assumed E2 exists, but I will go backwards in a minute. Okay, but um, given, given my E1 class, so given my first order deformation, I consider under this co-boundary map, I consider its image here. Okay, so I'm only using E1 to define this part of the diagram because I'm only using this exact sequence. Oh, it's come back again. Does that mean someone's asked a question? So I'm going to point anyway, but for you guys. Um, so given an E1, I can still form this right-hand vertical sequence, and therefore I can take this co-boundary map, and so I can define the co-boundary of E1 as some class in X2, and I call that the obstruction space, all right? Uh, the obstruction element. So this obstruction element in X2 is going to vanish whenever I have a flat E2, when I, whenever, whenever I have a a sheaf to second order. So that, that's obvious from this, this exact sequence of X groups. Okay? And now I need to check the converse that when this obstruction class vanishes, can I produce an E2? And probably I just set that as an exercise. I can't remember. Um, I see now we have the same problem again. I shouldn't, yeah. Can I ask a question? So, so what happens is whenever I go into the chat, I can no longer move my slides, like on the keyboard or with this. So what did you do last time? I pressed some random buttons. I can do it you again. Press, okay, please, just <laughs> <laughs> lean on the keyboard. I'll work my magic. Okay, great. Thanks, Andre. Yeah. Yeah, so a stupid question for me about it. So you know, the abstraction class for the first order um, extension was kind of quadratic, right? Because yeah. You took the cut product of it. Um, yeah. That's on the next, next slide. You're getting ahead. Then it's in, in, in the second order slide. extension, it, it seems like the uh, abstraction class is linear because you take just the composition of the co-boundary map, which is linear. Yeah, but that co-boundary map is cut product with E. You're, yeah, you're going to see that. I, I think I'm going to answer your question. I'll check with you in a minute. I'm not sure. Yeah, well, how do you do that? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Andre. Right, so I think this answers your question, but I'll check with you in a minute. So the right-hand vertical exact sequence was given by the extension class E1. So we just go back, right? This guy, the right-hand vertical exact sequence, is extension by E1. And, and therefore, this co-boundary map is cut product with E1. That's how, that's how ext works. What's this called? Something ext. Someone's description of X, there's a name attached to this property. Sorry? Is it Yoneda X? Yeah, it is. That's correct. Yeah. So that's Yoneda's description of X. So uh, this, this obstruction class is quadratic. It's E1 cup E1. Is that what your question was? But E1 is the first order extension, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. 
And so you're saying that the, uh, the second owner section has a fraction class equal to E1 cap E1? No, so what I'm saying is the first order extension class defines this obstruction class. Yeah. And what this means is this vanishes if and only if my first order extension extends to a second order extension. So this vanishes if and only if E1 lifts to an E2. Okay? So if this vanishes, then there exists an E2. There's a whole choice of them, but there exists an E2, and now you get a second order extension. But what was then, uh, so you also had previously a cut product of some class, right, for the first order extension. What was that? Yeah, that was for vector bundles. So that was a special case of this. And, and there, for vector bundles, because everything was locally trivial, there were no problems with doing these extensions locally. The problem was, did they glue globally? So it was to do with the co-cycle condition. But, but these, these two classes are the same. If, if your sheets are locally free, then this is the same. But then it was the first order extension, no? No. Nope. Let's check. Mm. Here. So, um, of course, I didn't do it, but I said when you take the co-cycle condition to mod t cubed, so you look at it, whether it defines a second order extension, oh. then you find the obstruction is here. Okay. I'm kind of keenly aware that you can't, uh, if this is new to you, you cannot absorb it in 10 minutes in a lecture. This is, this is a guide to what you should go away and, you know, work extremely hard on and suffer with. And, you know, I have sympathy. I've suffered with it in the past. Okay. So we got to here. So when the obstruction is zero, I get an E2. I can lift my E1 to an E2, and get that E2 gives me this central horizontal exact sequence. Okay? And um, again, my claim is that defines me a second order extension. So it defines an OXT modulo T cubed module where the T action is given again by pi composed iota, iota composed pi. Okay, so extension, uh, exercise, show that is indeed a CT modulo T cubed module and show it's flat over, over there. And then this is a bit evil, maybe don't do that. Okay, so I, I don't think, um, I didn't do this for the sake of exposition or I didn't do this example because I expect you to understand it. I did it to show you that um, these exercises can be done and they're hard and they take time and uh, you have to suffer. Um, and I just wanted to be honest and show you that I, d I have done the examples myself at some point in my life. Okay, but yeah, they're tough. Yeah? This obstruction, uh, obstruction class will characterize the second row or it's just uh, implied uh, existence? Just existence, because there's choices, because there's another group down here, right? So in this long as that sequence of extension groups, we should have underneath, we should have x1, E naught, E naught. So that given your E1, the choice of lifts to E2, I give it, you know, there's choices given by this X1, E naught, E naught. So they're not unique. They're only unique up to the action of X1. So as you go to second order, you can pick a first order deformation to deform it by. So instead of picking a straight line deformation, you can make it curve. I don't know. Maybe that's not a very good way of saying it. Okay, so you can do all these things. I just wanted to do it because whenever you look at a book, they always say, oh yeah, here's first order deformations, and you can show that second order deformations live in this group, and then no one ever does it. So there you go, that's how you do it. All right, how are we doing for time? Uh, we should stop. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I, I carry on next time. Ah, there is a question. There's a question. Uh, sure. Does X go to third order imply that there is a neat formula for the obstruction there? Yeah. Um, yeah, there is. So I guess the question is if we space H3 or X3. Or no, I mean, it, it also lies in X2. It lies in the same group. Uh, so what was the obstruction to going to third order? Oh, 
what's the formula? What's the answer? What's the formula? Yeah, and it's very similar, right? Um, it's it's basically uh, instead of e1 copy one, I want to say it's e1 copy two, but you have to interpret that correctly. But it lies in the same group. It lies in x2 e0 e0. So yeah, that's important that the the obstructions and all the choices and deformations to each order, they're all governed by the original E0. That's kind of interesting. Yeah, okay, so whoever asked that question, that, that's good, you've set yourself an exercise. i let you do it instead of me. Anything, yeah, anything else? Maybe this was a depressing note to end on. <laughs> Yeah. Well, maybe the question's a bit off topic, but I was wondering, if you, so these two stability conditions defined, are these stability conditions in the sense of Richland? No, not quite. I mean, yeah, no, they're not. But they're not far off. They're, they're in the space of Bridgeland stability conditions, there's something called the large volume limit, and they're very, very close to being um, stability conditions there, but they're not quite. For curves they are, that's correct, yeah, yeah. And then for surfaces, the way you deal with the zero-dimensional sheaves is slightly different. Um, and it's to do with the fact, you know, that slope only sees the rank and the first churn class. It doesn't even see the second churn class. But for stable objects, you have a Bogomolov inequality, which means that you have some control on the second churn class, and, and that's dealt with slightly differently in Bridgeland stability from this. You need to do a certain tilt where those zero-dimensional sheaves get shifted by a minus one or something like that and then work in that abelian category. I don't know if I'm saying words that mean anything to you. But uh, yeah, that you, you have to deal ever so slightly differently with the, the zero-dimensional sheaves. But it's very close, yeah. Other question, comments, over Zoom? So let's thank uh, each other. Thank you.